Hi there! In this episode of our series on securing the remote workforce, we want to take a deep dive into what every employee gets many times a day, even more so now that they're remote, and which can pose a great threat on the security of an organization. We're talking about emails, of course. The risk from malicious emails must not be underestimated, with over 90% of the attacks on organizations coming from this factor. Let's take a look at the latest in email-driven attacks. Type number one, phishing. This first type is quite familiar, yet it has evolved greatly since the days of the email from the fake Nigerian prince. These days, phishing emails involve very sophisticated social engineering techniques that are, that are designed to exploit vulnerabilities, both in systems and especially in human beings. They include spoofing techniques that are designed to make the email look legitimate to the unsuspecting eye. While there are different types of email phishing attacks, the most common and dangerous ones are impersonation, spear phishing, and business email compromise, also known as BEC. And in some cases, phishing attempts are actually the first step in a bigger plan of attack. Phishing emails typically ask their recipients to log in to an account, which results in the user unknowingly giving their credentials to a fake login page owned by the hackers. Some examples include links to files allegedly hosted on Google Drive, a request for verification of a PayPal transaction, or an invitation to a session on Microsoft Teams. In other cases, the phishing email would direct the recipient to purchase merchandise from a fake website. Type number two is account takeover. These attacks aim to steal users' credentials in order to access their accounts and steal sensitive information, money, or to intercept private communications. Account takeover can even be the start of a lateral attack on an organization, since, when successful, they provide hackers with access to a real account, which they then use as if they were the true owner. This typically starts from a spear phishing campaign against a specific person in the organization who has authority to access sensitive information or to approve financial transactions. Let's take a close look at a real and very interesting case. In a recent Checkpoint research report, we investigated a real case which involved a group of hackers dubbed the Florentine Banker Group. In this case, there was an attack using both threat vectors, phishing and account takeover, which targeted three large organizations from the financial service sector in the UK and Israel. And the case was fascinating indeed. The three firms who were attacked handle and transfer large sums of money to new partners and third-party providers on a weekly basis using Office 365 as their main email platform. As for the methodology of the crime, here's how it unfolds. Initially, there was the first contact. The Florentine Banker Group started their attack by setting up a targeted phishing campaign against individuals within the company. The target could be the CEO, CFO, or other key individual within the organization who can authorize the execution of money transactions. In our case, the first phishing emails targeted two personnel, of which one provided their credentials. The phishing attack then continued for weeks, persisting until the attackers gained a full view of the financial transaction landscape of the company. Next, observe. The Florentine banker spent days, weeks, and even months on reconnaissance before actively intervening in communications. Then, control and isolate. After carefully studying the victim's organization, the attackers would start to isolate the victim from third parties and colleagues by creating mailbox rules that would forward incoming emails to a mailbox that is actually owned and operated by the attacker. These email rules diverted emails from interesting contacts or subject lines into a folder that is monitored by the threat group, essentially creating a type of man-in-the-middle attack. For example, any email that contained predefined words such as invoice, returned, or fail would be moved to another folder that isn't typically used by the victim, such as the RSS feeds folder. Next step, setting up the lookalike. In order to proceed to the next stage of the operation, the attackers registered lookalike domains, which are domains that are similar to the legitimate domains of the entities involved in the email correspondence targeted for interception. For example, 
if there was a correspondence between financialfirm.com and bankingservice.com, the attackers would register similar domains such as financialfirms.com and bankingservices.com. Once the setup is complete, the attacker would start sending emails from the lookalike domains. They either create a new conversation or continue an existing one, deceiving the target who assumes that the source of the email is legitimate, not noticing the slight change to the domain name from which it came. Then, ask for money. By the time we get to this stage, the attackers already have great control over the firm's inbound email traffic and can create lookalike emails that seem to be legitimate. Now the attackers begin manipulating bank account information with their own fraudulent information. In our case, the attackers identified a planned transaction with a third party in which the firm suggested using a UK bank account to speed up the process. But the receiving party reported that they don't have a bank account in the UK. So the threat group leveraged the opportunity to provide an alternative account. During the reconnaissance phase, the attackers learned how money transfers are executed, what are the procedures, approval cycles, and most importantly, who are the key people within the compromised organization who make these transfers happen. Back to our case, the hackers secured email correspondence between the firm and the bank through which it makes money transfers. Using this information, the Florentine Banker Group reached out to the firm's contact at the bank and instructed them to make new money transfers. And the final step, the actual money transfer. The Florentine banker manipulated the conversation until the third party approved the new banking details and authorized the transaction. Throughout this operation, the group succeeded in transferring approximately £600,000 accumulated by three different successful transactions that could not be overturned. This story is a great, yet unfortunate, real-life example of how a successful phishing attack can lead to credential theft and to massive financial losses. And let's not forget about malware. There's another threat vector with email attacks, and this is malicious files and attachments, or malware. These attacks may seem basic, but can be devastating to organizations. Malware attacks can range from a seemingly innocent resume file that's sent to HR, and up to an invoice file that's sent to account payable. The goal of these emails is to infect the user's machine so as to control it and the data in it. In many cases, hackers can even leverage this attack to set off a lateral infection to other machines across the network. One of the most severe attacks executed by malware attachments and files is ransomware. This type of attack used the malicious payloads hidden in the attached files to take control over the user's device and hold it hostage until a certain amount of money is paid. A recent example includes a ransomware attack on the city of New Orleans, where attackers shut down the New Orleans government system and more than 4,000 computers were affected, causing over $7 million in losses. These attacks go to show that no organization, big or small, is completely safe against these types of threats. And what about data leakage? Well, the last threat vector we want to cover is not necessarily an attack, yet it is costing organizations a lot of money, and this is leakage of sensitive information. Employees can leak sensitive data, intentionally or unintentionally, and this can cost organizations a great deal of money, whether through regulatory compliance fines or, when it's customer data loss, this can result in income loss and damage to customer trust. In conclusion, as we can see, emails can be leveraged by hackers quite successfully to cause a lot of damage to organizations. Many people get more emails on a daily basis than they can deal with, so they are less suspecting or don't have the capacity to check every one of them. With the new state of remote work, the threat is even bigger. The attackers are exploiting unsuspecting employees who are using cloud-based email and productivity applications that don't have the same security as on-prem solutions. So, how can you protect your organization from this attack vector, which is so commonly used and is so widespread? Make sure to check out the next and final episode in our series in which we will cover the five must-haves for protecting Office 365 and G Suite. In the meantime, I invite you to download right here an infographic providing more details about cyber threats to cloud emails and productivity suites.